Let's pray. Lord, we're, we're just so grateful that we can come into your presence this morning, and uh, thank you that you give us the gift of worship, uh, of music and song, and we can raise our voices to you and, and our hearts, and you can just fill us with your Holy Spirit, and we can just give a little bit back of what you've given to us. And Lord, I just pray right now, if anybody has come in here with just stuff uh, that's, that's weighing them down, Lord, uh, right now that you just release that burden from their shoulders, and, and that they would feel the freedom that only you can provide. And, and that uh, you would not allow the enemy uh, to get any foothold here. And that uh, your joy and your peace and your love would reign. And so now, Lord, as we open up your word, that uh, you would speak to us through it and change us and move us in the direction that you would have us go. In Jesus' name, amen. Open up your Bibles, if you will, to James chapter 4. As we continue our journey through James. We're starting in verse 1. My intent, again, was to go through a bunch of chapter 4, but we're going to do three verses, Lord willing. Verse 1 says, What causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? Is it not this? that your passions are at war within you. You desire and do not have, so you murder. You covet and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. We'll pause there for a minute. So let's take a deep breath. We've been going through James. Deep breath, everybody. <sighs> James has been beating us up pretty good, hasn't he? Been kind of a rough journey for me, and, and you know, as, as God has been working on me through the Holy Spirit, guess what? I get to share that with you. <laughs> and so, you know, and, and it, it's been great. It's been hard, but it's been great. There's a lot of cool stuff in here. And, and to me, if you could sum up this letter so far, it's telling us that a genuine faith, a genuine faith will be accompanied by a lifestyle that is consistent with that faith, Right? we've got that genuine faith, then we're going to have a lifestyle that is consistent with that faith. There's, there's going to be something that's observable from that faith. In other words, that faith that Jesus referred to as being born again when he was talking with Nicodemus in John chapter 3 is not only a faith that saves, it's not only a faith that saves, but it's a faith that transforms. It's so powerful that it not only saves us, and destines us to spend an eternity with him, but it transforms our lives right here on earth. And it begins a journey of transformation. In 2 Corinthians it says we are what? New creations. We're new creations. The old has passed away, and behold, everything has become new. And as we said last week, you don't do all this stuff that James is talking about to gain salvation. It's not a works-based salvation. You don't earn it. You do all this stuff because of your salvation. It's in response to your salvation that we do this stuff because he's done such a great work in us and he continues to change us from the inside out. So James is methodically working through some of the things that cause us to slip or cause, cause us to wander off the path that God has prepared for us. James is addressing those things that we need to watch out for. And a lot of people struggle with James. James tends to have a very different tone than perhaps Paul in some of his letters. Paul talks, especially in Romans and, and in Hebrews, he talks a lot about grace. And James here is talking a lot about works. And people struggle with that. And some people even think there's conflict there, but there isn't conflict there. The two go hand in hand. They have a hard time reconciling that new covenant message of being sanctified and justified by grace, right? By grace alone. I haven't even sang about that. And then we've got all this work stuff that James is talking about, and we've got to be very careful here because so many get caught up in all this work stuff. So many have been caught up, caught up in works for centuries, haven't they? And even today, there's still some that get caught up in all the work stuff as a way to earn your salvation. We've got to be careful that that's not what's being taught here in this letter. 
And so we need to be clear that regardless of what we do, there are none righteous in God's eyes. Right? Regardless of what we do, there's none that are righteous on our own. Isaiah 64 says, our, righteous, our righteousness is like filthy rags. And it's only through Christ that God can look on us as perfect and pure and sinless through the work of Christ on the cross, through the shedding of his blood. And yet there's an expectation for us to abide, to abide in the vine and to grow in him. Ephesians chapter 2, if you turn there, Verses 3 to 5, Paul does discuss this, this point. This change that happens, this transformation that happens. Ephesians 2, verse 3, it says, Among them, we too all formerly lived in the lusts of our flesh. We used to live that way. We too formerly lived that way, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind. And were by nature children of what? Wrath. Even as the rest but God, being rich in mercy, there's those two words I'd love to see, but God, we were like that, but God, being rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. And turn back to John chapter 14, verses 12 to 15. John 14, 12 to 15. Jesus says in verse 12, Truly, truly, I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also. He who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also. And greater works than he, these he will do. Because I go to the Father, and whatever you ask in my name, that will I do. So that the Father may be glorified in the Son. And if you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. Say that again. If you ask me anything in my name, in the name of Jesus, I will do it. And then he finishes in verse 15. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. And so our salvation is secure as we put our faith in him and abide in him. And then we're given the Holy Spirit that empowers us, convicts us of our sin. And is that fire inside of us that we just sang about that causes us to have that burning desire, that fierce desire to live our lives in a way that brings Him glory. That's how we want to live our lives. To live our lives as a living sacrifice, right? And so James, through the Holy Spirit, is giving us a navigation aid here in this letter. What navigators on ships use to safely navigate to their destination. These charts point out rocks and shoals, right? They point out things that could harm us to avoid along the way and point to a way that is deep and clear of danger. The Lord doesn't want us shipwrecked. So he tells us how we should guide our steps as we follow him. And so, James says in verse 1 here, what causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? Is it not this, that you, your passions are at war within you? Your passions are at war within you. You desire and do not have, so you murder. You covet and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. So here again, like last week, James begins with a rhetorical question. What causes quarrels and fights? What causes quarrels and fights? In the Greek there, it's really, those words are stronger. What causes battles and conflicts and contention among you? Think about it. What causes those battles and contention that, that come up among us as we live our lives together? What's at the root of that conflict? And then he answers his own question. It's your passions. What causes those conflicts are your passions inside of you. Greek word, hedonon. We get the word hedonism for passions. The lust for pleasure of our 
senses. It's that selfish, fleshly desire to get what we want, right? It's what I want, to satisfy my desires. It's all about me. It's what our culture tells us. You earned it. You deserve it. And that desire to please me, inside of me, is at war with the work that the Holy Spirit has done in me to want to do what He wants me to do. There's a struggle going on. There's conflict going on there. And it's a turf war, right? There's a turf war going on within our hearts. A war for control. A war for pleasing me versus pleasing God. It goes on every day. And it's real, isn't it? It's real stuff. You see that thing you want. You see it there. But you know that it's not good for you to have. It's clearly marked out in this chart that we have. This word of God that we have. It's clearly marked out as being, it's off limits. You don't want to go near there. A lot of shipwrecks there. And we know about them. We can read about them. But those desires within us are powerful, aren't they? Those desires are powerful. And they can talk you into all kinds of things. It's not really a dangerous area. It's just a reef. Reefs are kind of pretty, aren't they? Let's go check that reef out. It's not going to, nothing's going to happen to you there. There's no harm in just going to look at it, is there? And next thing you know, you're all jammed up on the reef. You're shipwrecked. You can't get off, and your boat's all, to- boat's all torn up, and you look like a fool because you didn't listen. You thought you could navigate your way around it, but it doesn't happen. And Satan just says to himself, yep, I got another one. I got another one. These passions, they're at war with us every day. We desire and we don't have. So we murder, James says. Perhaps not literal murder. But as Jesus says in Matthew chapter 5, that if you're angry with your brother, in effect, you're guilty of murder. Even if you're angry, Jesus said, you're guilty of murder. So we covet and we don't obtain. So we fight and quarrel. And think about it. What causes most quarrels and divisions? We each just want our own way. We just want to exert our own wants, our own desires. Ever gone to a church business meeting? And they're discussing a decision that needs to be made. And there needs to be a vote on this decision. Let's say... The decorating committee has been put together and they're deciding on a new carpet to put in the sanctuary and asked to provide a recommendation that the church can vote upon. And so they've done that. And you go to the business meeting. Anybody predict what happens next? It's a food fight. Oftentimes it's a food fight over a carpet. People that have been there quite a while, they, they like that old color. That color has suited that fellowship well, and they want to kind of stick with that because it feels comfortable, it feels right, it's home, right? And the younger people want something more contemporary, something more up-to-date. And the more artsy people, they want something with some flair and pizzazz. And the frugal people don't see anything wrong with that old carpet anyway. Why do we need to spend money on carpet? And the next thing you know, you got people leaving the church because their suggestion wasn't received well. And if that's the way you want to treat us after coming here for 15 years, we're just going to go to that church across the road. they got hardwood floors. That's what we're all about. We don't need no carpet. We desire and can't obtain. And so we get angry and we lash out. The next thing you know, you just got this big crater over something silly when you look back on it. But it happens. Our passions are at war within us. And the passion, the passion that you feed 
The passion that you feed will become the one that is the strongest, right? If you've got two conflicting things at war within you, the passion that you feed will be the one that wins. So you have to be careful about the passion that you feed. We need to remember that we should have the mind of Christ. But we should have the mind of Christ. Not the passions of the flesh. To love like he loves. To have concern about what he is concerned about. To truly be a living sacrifice. It's not about me and my passions. What I need, what I want, isn't really important in the big scheme of things. It's about him. And when I do what he wants, I have more joy and peace than if I tried to get what I want anyway. Because I never get enough. When I get what he wants, I feel fulfilled. I feel at peace and I feel joy. So I need to be dead to myself and living completely for him. He says you do not have, back in James, Verse 2, you do not have because you do not ask. You ask and you do not receive because you've asked wrongly to spend it on your passions. So James here first says, we don't have because we don't ask. Why don't we ask? What would be the reason why we don't ask? Let's think about that. Sometimes, perhaps we think it's trivial. We don't ask God because it's, why would a God, the creator of the universe, be bothered with some little thing that I, I feel I want to bring to his attention? Why would he care about that? But he does. Or maybe it's, we don't have the faith enough to ask him for the really big thing. We don't have enough faith to ask for that. Or maybe we're afraid to ask because of how he will answer. We're afraid of what he might tell us to do or how he will bring it to pass. There's a fear there sometimes. Maybe we're just too busy. Maybe we don't ask because our lives are so full and so busy. We rush from place to place. We just don't have time to ask anymore. And for whatever reason, we may be missing God's blessing because we do not ask. And James says, then there are the times that we do ask and we don't receive because we ask with the wrong motives. We ask because of those passions that are inside of us, those fleshly things, to spend it on our fleshly desires, he says. And I think it's interesting that James uses the word spend here. To spend it on our desires. You ask and don't receive because you're going to spend that gift of answered prayer on earthly passions, not on spiritual passions. 1 John 5.14 says, And this is the confidence that we have toward him, that if we ask anything, if we ask anything, if we ask anything according to his name or according to his will, he hears us. That's the confidence that we have toward him. Kyle Eidelman, the pastor and author, says that prayer is not giving orders, but instead it's reporting for duty. I like that. Prayer isn't giving orders to God. It's reporting for duty. It helps us get into alignment with his will as we pray. You ever find yourself praying out loud with people And then you kind of replay in your head what you just prayed. And it's like, what was that? I do. You pray with people, and and afterwards you kind of review in your mind, what what, what did I just say? What did I just pray? God wants us to pray. God often withholds his hand until we pray, right? Right? So many times in Scripture... God acts as a result of prayer for some reason. I don't understand it, but that's his will. That's how, we, that's how he operates. He wants us involved with him as he does his work. He wants us to, 
Come to him in prayer. You think about Nehemiah's prayer before he went before the king to ask for permission to go back to Jerusalem and rebuild those walls. And he's just praying, God, help me find favor. Because the king just could have wrecked him, could have killed him. And, and God answers that prayer. And Elijah prayed. And it didn't rain for three and a half years. And he prayed again and it rained. Gabriel tells Daniel that he was sent to him at the beginning of your pleas for mercy. Gabriel, the archangel, then appears to Daniel. And Peter receives the vision, the sheet that came down out of heaven with the unclean animals when he's up on the top of his roof doing what? Praying. He was in prayer as this vision came to him. And in that same chapter, an angel came to Cornelius and said, your prayers and alms have ascended as a memorial before God. James is saying here is if we're not seeing fruit from our prayer life, then it may be a good idea to examine if we are praying. And then what exactly are we praying for and why? It's really what he's saying here. Turn to Matthew chapter 7, verses 7 to 8. Jesus talks about prayer. Matthew 7, 7 to 8. He says, ask. It's the first word he uses. Ask. And it will be given to you. Seek. And you will find. Knock. And it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks, receives. And the one who seeks, receives. Finds. And to the one who knocks, it will be opened. God wants us to report for duty through prayer. He wants us to be a part of his work. And the prayer, the prayers that we offer are the tip of the spear. They're that tip of the spear. Prayer is what opens doors for God to do his work. Oswald Chambers said, we do not pray at all until we are at our wit's end. We don't pray at all until we're at our wit's end. R.A. Torrey said of D.L. Moody, out of a very intimate acquaintance with D.L. Moody, I wish to testify that he was a far greater prayer than he was a preacher. And that's saying something about D.L. Moody, who led thousands to the Lord. Tories calls him a far better prayer than he was a preacher. Time and time again, he says, he was confronted by obstacles that seemed insurmountable. But he always knew the way to overcome all difficulties. Moody knew how to overcome those difficulties. He knew the way to bring to pass anything that he needed to be brought to pass. He knew and believed in the deepest depths of his soul that nothing was too hard for the Lord. And that prayer could do anything that God could do. Prayer could do anything that God could do. Hudson Taylor, he said, the prayer power has never been tried to its full capacity. It's never been done. If we want to see mighty wonders of divine power and grace wrought in the place of weakness, failure, and disappointment, let us answer God's standing challenge. Let us answer God's standing challenge Call unto me, and I will answer thee, and show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. We're going to start something here in this fellowship in, Jan in January. Starting January 11th, Saturday mornings once a month, we're going to open up these doors at 9 o'clock in the morning for whoever feels led to come in and simply do nothing but pray. We're going to pray for the Lord to do amazing things through this ministry, through his work, here in this area and around the world. I feel it's important for us not only to be in prayer as individuals at home, as we're going about our days, but it's important for us to gather corporately and pray together about the work that God is doing here. And I like what Oswald Chambers says. 
we do not pray at all until we're at our wit's end. I find that true. From my experience, there's great power in the prayer of desperation. You cry out to God to act with the faith that, and act with the faith that He will do so because we desperately need Him to do so. I love going back and reading the early Psalms of David. And he's crying out to God because he needs God to work. He's stuck in some cave somewhere because Saul, Saul is hunting him down. Or his son is hunting him down. He's crying out to the Lord. I love to read those Psalms. They're so powerful. And those prayers are specific. They're calls to action. And they're balanced, as Mark taught. It's an old acronym that when I was taught to pray, ACTS, A-C-T-S, they're balanced with adoration and confession and thanksgiving and supplication. They're not just a quick sprint of giving thanks before a meal or a brief mumbled prayer before I collapse exhausted into my bed. But they're an intimate time with God, alone and unhurried. Let me say that again. They're an intimate time with God, alone and unhurried. Picture that. In this day and age. As if we were with the creator of the universe and the creator of each one of us, and he really wants to spend time with us. Because he does. And in the type of prayer that is the catalyst for the winning of battles in the spiritual world. Because that's what we're praying for. That's where the battles are really going on. We don't see it. There's battles raging around us right now. Can't forget that we wrestle not with flesh and blood, right? The heavy lifting is done through fervent prayer, being bold enough to pray for God to move mightily. And as he does his work ahead of us, as he does his work ahead of us, because we don't want to be out in front of God, as he tills the ground, he allows us to plant the seeds. So he's out in front of us doing that hard work, and as we pray, that work happens and allows us to plant the seeds behind him as he is tilling that ground. As it, and as he waters the seedlings, we contend them and remove the weeds. We're working together with him. And as he prepares the fruit for the harvest, we simply bring the harvest in. That's how God works. And through prayer, that's how that operates. That's ministry. That's what it's all about. Prayerfully working behind the Lord as he does the work of the master gardener. And we do the work of the devoted servants. Or, putting it another way, working together as one body with Christ as the head. As the various parts of our physical bodies communicate back and forth with our head, right? Through our nervous system. Just as that happens within our bodies. If you severed that, it doesn't work. And so also, we need to have a constant flow of communication up to the head of our body and back to us. It's necessary for this to all work. We should never lose that connection with Him. And when it's working, that body is working miraculously as one. It's amazing to see. And we see what he sees. And we feel what he feels. And we respond how he would respond. As that connection is maintained and strengthened. And that's how Jesus lived through his earthly ministry, isn't it? You think about how Jesus operate. He would be out there working, then he would withdraw by himself to pray with the Father. spent time in prayer and time alone with his father and that was at the core of his ministry if you could picture 
a nuclear reactor. I was trying in my mind to picture what this looks like. And if you picture a nuclear reactor with all the systems around it, necessary to operate that reactor to produce steam, which produces electricity. At the heart of the reactor is the core. And that core that has fuel and rods to contain the reaction. And that's where the action really is taking place as those atoms are split. And as those atoms are split, energy is given off in, in various forms, one of which is heat. And that heat heats up the water that surrounds the reactor. And the water turns to steam. And the steam then powers the turbine, and the turbine produces electricity. But at the heart of that entire process is the reactor core. Prayer is the reactor core of our spiritual lives. Prayer is the reactor core of our spiritual lives. That's really where the action is taking place. The victories that are achieved and the sound decisions that are made as we move forward in the faith are the result of the spiritual batters, battles that are won through prayer, not of our own strength. Luke chapter 6 verses 12 to 13, talks about the night before Jesus chose the 12 disciples. And what does it say he did? If you turn to Luke 6, 12 to 13, it says, In these days he went where? Out to the mountain to pray. And all night, how long? All night, he continued in prayer to God. And when day came, he called his disciples and chose from them 12 whom he called apostles. Something. Jesus, the Son of God, spent all night in prayer before he came down to choose the 12. So we have God in the flesh the Father is in him, and he is in the Father, and he spends all night with his Father prior to choosing the twelve. Isn't that amazing? So how should we approach our decisions and our ministries? I think I need to take that as an example, don't you? Those of you who are football fans, I've got a football now. I did the reactor core analogy. I'm not sure how many reactor plant operators. I used to work on nuclear submarines, so I, have, I know a little bit about that. But football. Think about the communication between the quarterback and the coach. In the old days, they used to do signals. Not anymore. They've got radios. They're talking on radios. Now the coach can relay plays in through the radios. But they do more than that. They work together day and night during the preseason. Learning the plays, practicing the plays, getting it down so it's automatic. Communicating and working together. Understanding and improving the quarterback's strengths and weaknesses. Right? They work on the strengths to make them even better. And they work to improve those weaknesses so that they can't become flaws that the defense can exploit. They spend time together so each of them knows how the other thinks. The good coach knows exactly what the quarterback is thinking. And the good quarterback knows exactly what their coach is thinking. They're like one. And before facing an opponent, they'll spend time together watching films, going over the defense of their opponent, and looking for areas of weakness and opportunity that they can exploit. Putting a plan together. And then it's game time, and these days the coaches, as I said, able to communicate to the quarterback through this wireless headset. You see the coaches, they got these Headphones on, a little microphone coming down, and inside the helmet of the quarterback. He's got a little earpiece. He's got a, a speaker in there that he can hear what the coach is saying. He can hear what the coach is communicating. He's whispering in his ear. What to do next and what to watch out for. And sometimes you can see the quarterback in a loud game. He's got his hands over those holes in his helmet. Because the noise is so loud because he wants to hear what the coach is saying. He wants to hear the voice of his coach. 
And the coach has eyes up in the sky. They've got coaches that are up there in the coach's box, way up on top of the stadium. They can see all of what's going on. How the defenses are actually reacting to the plays that are, that are happening. They can see the game strategically from beginning to end. The big picture. And they can relay opportunities down to that offensive coordinator, the guy that's talking to the quarterback, and who can take that data and translate it into plays. He's got this little card in front of him. He has all the plays, and he calls the play in. The quarterback just keeps getting the next play, doesn't he? I got the next play. Goes into the huddle. He calls the play, and they execute. And they come back. He gets the next play. They go to the huddle, and then they go execute. As they're doing all that, there's this bigger plan that's unfolding. The eyes in the sky and the coach, they understand we've got a strategy. We've got a game plan to win. But all the quarterback is getting is the next step. Here's your play. Make it happen. And he listens, and he obeys. And during the week after the game, they talk through the recordings of the game. They watch the films, what went right and what went not so well, things that we could do better. They get together as one, going through that. How can we make things better? And we as humans have come to understand the importance of communication, haven't we? We have understood the importance of communication. If you take a group of teens or young adults out to a restaurant, and the waitress sits you at the table, what's the first thing that happens? Right? We're communicating. The phones are out. We're texting or we're tweeting or we're Instagramming or perhaps if they're talking with their parents, they're on Facebook. That's, Facebook's going, going downhill, by the way. I just found that out this week. Facebook is for the older crowd, right? Right, Evan? They're in there, they're tweeting and Instagramming. If they're going to talk with their parents, they're going to put a post on Facebook. All right, whatever. Facebook is old news. But they're communicating constantly. We're communicating constantly, aren't we? And it, but somehow we isolate ourselves. We get on this thing from whoever we're with. That's why it's interesting when you go to a restaurant and you see this young couple in love. They go to the restaurant to have a nice romantic dinner. They sit down. They place their order. They look in each other's eyes, in the other's eyes, and they get on their cell phone. <laughs> Isn't that sweet? We isolate ourselves from who we're with to communicate virtu- about virtually nothing to somebody who we're not with. Doesn't that seem odd to you? Isn't it curious? And everywhere we go, you see people doing this as they walk. They're going across the street. Got their head down. At the garbage man, this is absolute truth. Watching out my window, I hear a loud truck come by this past week, working on this message, as a matter of fact. That's why it's in here. The garbage man, as he's emptying my garbage can, because they, they don't have to, have to actually empty it anymore. They got this device that comes and lifts it up. and So he, as he hits the button, he, he's got his gloves on, which are full of who knows what, and he's on his, he's, he's on his phone. Like, a man, I'd hate to have that phone up to my whatever, but... Even the garbage man's on the, on the phone. I was like, really? But I digress. We in our culture have developed an extreme aversion to just sitting quietly, to just sitting quietly and having no information or no entertainment streaming into our brains, haven't we? We've got an aversion to that. If, if we sit down and don't have something coming at us as a way of information or entertainment, we don't know what to do anymore. If we're at home, the TV or the computer is on, or the tablet or the phone is in our hand, and if we're in the car, we've got satellite radio, we've got the iPod plugged in. If we've got free time at work, we've got buds in our ears, playing music or whatever, and and blocking out everybody around us. And go back and look at Jesus and and how he operated in his ministry. He spent a lot of time at work. 
Even the Bible says he grew weary as he walked and worked. But he would go away in quiet time and spend it alone with his father. And it concerns me. It concerns me about myself. When we live in an age, we've developed such a reliance on information and entertainment that we can't even stand to be alone and quiet with our Lord. It's difficult for Him to get that message through. We've got to put our hands up in those little holes in our helmet to block out all that stuff so we can hear Him whispering in our ear. Give us that play. Give us that guidance. James says, you do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions. So as I read this, I think about the quantity and the quality of the conversations that Jesus had with his Father. That's what I look as a model. I look at that. The quality and the quantity of those conversations. The time he spent with him and how he spent it. And I think about the quantity... (laughs) The quantity and the quality of the conversations that a quarterback has with his coach before the season, during the game, and then after the game during the week, and how much they're in touch and how much they're communicated. Why? Because it's necessary. In order for that team to be successful, in order for them to execute the plays the way they're supposed to be run, that communication has to be solid. Quantity has to be large, and the quantity, quality has to be strong. And then I think about the quantity and the quality of the conversations that I have with my Father in heaven. And I'm challenged by that. This is good stuff. James says, you don't have because you don't ask. Maybe I'm too busy. Maybe I can't even... Take the time to ask. But if I do ask, maybe I'm not receiving it because I ask wrongly. I'm spending it on the passions of my heart, of my flesh, and not on what Jesus would have have me focused on. Romans 8.26. Love this verse. Turn there if you would. Romans chapter 8. Paul in this letter is talking about this whole element of prayer. He says, likewise, in verse 26, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. The Holy Spirit helps us in our weakness. For we do not know what to pray for as we ought. We don't know. But the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. I like that. The Spirit intercedes for us with groanings that are too deep for words. Now go down eight verses to verse 34. Paul then writes, Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is what? Interceding for us. So we have Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit interceding with the Father for us. I don't know about you, but that makes me want to join with them. Right? If they're interceding for me, then boy, I better be in that mix. I should be a part of that. The Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And Jesus, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. I believe the most important role we may ever play in our spiritual lives is prayer. The most important role we will ever pray, play in our lives spiritually is prayer. And I know that I have not thought about it like that at all times. I have not approached my ministry like that at all times. I don't have because I don't ask. And I don't receive because I don't ask for the right motives. And so, as a result, I really want to start tuning out and turning off all that stuff that is just noise. I want to start 
turning it off and tuning it out. It's just distracting me from what's really important. Talking with my father. And not that any of that stuff is bad of itself. Nothing wrong with it. But it has its place. But we don't want them to become idols to us. And an idol is anything that comes between me and my father. That becomes more of a priority than my father in heaven. I want to make sure that I have that clear and constant connection with him. So I know what to do next. I need to know what that next play is. What am I supposed to do? And so he can hear from me the adoration and the confession and the thanksgiving and the supplication, the prayer request that I have. So he can hear from me that stuff because that's what he wants to hear. He wants to be in relationship with us. He wants to be in fellowship with us, in communion with us. He desires that because he knows what's good for us. And he loves us. And he loves to be with us. Well, I had this message complete. We got a magazine in the mail yesterday from the college that Evan goes to, Charleston Southern. And I'm just reading through a few pages of it, and it hits me. And, and, and there's an article in here that called The Power of Prayer. And I'm just going to share a piece of it with you. Uh, a group from his college went to Ethiopia on a missions trip. And it said, on the first day in Ethiopia, this girl, Riley Todd, met Hamat, a young man suffering from a malaria outbreak. This guy, Hamat, has got malaria. If you get malaria in the Western world, there are things that we can do for you. If you get malaria in a culture such as Ethiopia, you're probably not going to make it. And so they met this guy, Hamat. And a short time before the team was ready to leave the village, that's when they met. And the sight of the young man, cold and shivering, weak and disoriented, broke this girl's heart, who goes to college with Evan. It's not like America where you can go get a shot and feel better, she said. If you have malaria, you're most likely going to die. And as she sat, waiting for the SUV to pull away, she looked out the window, avoiding the others. She didn't want them to see her cry. Worried Hamat's illness would turn fatal, she prayed the Hannah prayer. She prayed the prayer of Hannah, asking God to restore his health. If you go to 1 Samuel chapter 1, we're just going to learn a little bit about the Hannah prayer. Hannah was the mother of whom? Anybody know? Samuel. Hannah was barren. Aaron had gone for years without a child. Her womb had been closed. And her husband, Elkanah, had another wife. And she had children. And she used to just rub it in to Hannah. And it just wore her out. And she cried out to the Lord. One day they went to Jerusalem, verse 12 in 1 Samuel chapter 1. And she said, and it says, As she continued praying before the Lord, Eli, who was the priest sitting there at the gate of the temple, he observed her mouth. Eli had observed her mouth moving. And Hannah was speaking in her heart. Only her lips moved and her voice was not heard. And therefore Eli took her to be drunk. Put your wine away from you, he said. How long will you go on being drunk? But Hannah answered, No, my Lord, I'm a woman troubled in spirit. I have drunk neither wine nor strong drink, but I have been pouring out my soul before the Lord. Do not regard your servant as a worthless woman, for all along I have been speaking out of my great anxiety and vexation. Then Eli answered, Go in peace, and the God of Israel grant your petition that you have made to him. And she said, Let your servant find favor in your eyes. And the woman went away and ate, and her face was no longer sad. And in verse 19 it says, And they rose early in the morning and worshipped before the Lord. And then they went back to their house at Ramah. And Elkanah knew Hannah, his wife, and the Lord remembered her. And in due time, Hannah conceived and bore a son. And she called his name Samuel. For she said, I have asked for him from the Lord. 
That was Hannah's prayer. That was Hannah's prayer that this girl remembered. And during her prayer, it says back in this article, Riley also made a bold promise. If Hamad is cured when I see him tomorrow, then there's absolutely nothing that will stop me from talking to him about Jesus, she prayed. She prayed for healing so that she could witness to him about Jesus. And she woke up the next morning, and her stomach was in knots. No one knew what was going on, but we all knew something was going to happen. We all knew something was going to happen. And they arrived at the village that morning, and Riley had tunnel vision. Her eyes were searching for one thing, one person, Hamat. And she finally spotted him standing beside a building. It was a peculiar sight, since he didn't often stand in this location, thought Riley. It's unusual for him to be there. And immediately when I looked at him, I knew he was not sick. The team got out of their vehicles, and Hamad approached them, smiling and shaking hands. And when he spotted Riley, he hugged her. And through a translator, Riley asked Hamad if he was feeling better, and his response was, perfect. Hamad had gone to a local medical clinic that morning, taken a blood test, and he told Riley he no longer had malaria. Cured. What happened was a miracle, one that could only come from the mighty power, power of God. And later on in this article, the church group, it says the church group had studied Acts before they went to Ethiopia. They studied Acts and how the God had been working through that early church and the power of God and the Holy Spirit had been working mightily. And they're like, oh man, wouldn't that be cool? And they said all through the book of Acts, you read about all these signs and wonders that God is doing. And then you go there. We go to Ethiopia. And we see God moving mightily. And the thing that struck me with me was, I want that here. And that, it's exactly what we've been talking about. God is still working that way. And it's cool to read the evidence of that. We're thankful for the earnest prayer of a woman to heal a broken young man. And we're thankful for a mighty God who had the power to do that healing. So back to the text. What causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? Is it not this, that your passions are at war within you? Where are your passions? This morning. Where are your passions? There's a big game going on out there. And the Lord wants us to be a part of it. Matthew chapter 9, verse 35 to 37 says, And Jesus went through all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and every affliction. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. And then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. God has a plan for each of us in all of this, each of us. You're a part of the team. We're a part of the team. We're all a part of the body of Christ that is at work. And we're all supposed to be on the field involved in the game. He wants us all in the game. For not many choose to actually step out with him on that field, right? Not many laborers actually choose to step out with him on that field. He wants us to be passionate about what he is passionate about. We don't have time for quarrels and fighting amongst ourselves. It's all about the flesh, and there's too much at stake. He wants us to spend real time with him. Spending time in earnest prayer. As if our spiritual life depended on it. Because it does. And as if the spiritual lives of others depended on it. Because it does. And because he desires it. He created us. And he wants to spend time with us and work through us and live lives, have us live lives where we find the true fulfillment and joy in him. Because we can't find it in anything else.
Let us pray. Heavenly Father, as we read from your word, we're challenged and, and yet it gives us joy. It gives us joy because we hear that you want a relationship with us. You want to be in communication with us. You want our passions to be your passions. And so, Lord, this morning, as the busyness of this season, of Christmas and New Year's, the noise of the world is all around us, my prayer is for all of us, especially for me, that you would help me to push that noise away, help all of us to push that noise away, to spend that quiet time alone with you, We pray that our passions would be your passions, that there would not be this battle going on within us that would feed the Holy Spirit that is within us so that those passions from the flesh would be behind us, as Paul said. Lord, we're thankful for the work that you do in the world. We're thankful for the healing of this young man over in Ethiopia because your spirit is still at work. And your spirit is still at work right here. So Lord, give us the boldness. Give us the courage. Give us the singleness of purpose to die to ourselves and to live for you. To be that living sacrifice such that we could even take 30 minutes out of our day, 2% of our day, and spend it alone with you, pouring out our praise, our confessions, our thanksgiving, and lifting up our supplications, and hearing from you what it is you'd have us to do next. Lord, that's my prayer. Help us to be sanctified in the way we live. Help us to live for you. So Lord, be with us as we have fellowship now and as we leave this place. I pray that you would fill us to overflowing, that we might be able to pour that living water into everyone we come in contact with. They would see the joy of the Lord on our face. In Jesus' name. Amen.